we're live. Hi, everybody. My name is Dr. Talia Marcajani, and today I'm going to read to you guys from an article that I wrote about my experience uh, doing the ketogenic diet for a year. Um, so as usual, I'm going to post the link to the original article, but I'm going to read to you this article just in case you're more of a listener than a reader, and I'll invite any comments or questions below. This should take about an hour, and um, yeah, and hopefully we'll continue the discussion. And as usual, this kind of video, you don't need to watch the video. There's not a lot of visuals that you need to follow. You can just listen to the audio so you can use this video um, as something that you're listening to on your commute or going for a walk or doing your vacuuming. So this is based on an article that I wrote called My Year of Living Ketogenically. And we're just waiting for some people to join, but I'll keep going. And then you guys can always catch this afterwards on YouTube or on Facebook. So... I've always had a sweet tooth. I remember, you know, binging on Halloween candy as a kid, or um, my mom would buy these Costco popcorns and hide them downstairs in the basement for our school lunches. And I'd go down there while watching TV. I'd open up these these little packets of cheesy popcorn, and I would shove it, shove this popcorn into my mouth, and then I'd sort of hide the bags so that she wouldn't know that I was eating them. Sort of like rebellious teenagers, sort of top vodka bottles up with water so that their parents don't know they've been drinking. So I was always sort of obsessed with carbohydrates and sweets and I was always hungry and I would always feel hangry in between meals. Uh, and my personal body type is that I can gain weight very easily and it takes a lot of concentrated effort to take it off. Oh, but I also put on muscle. So there's this, uh, this flip side to that. And so uh, in the fall of 2016, I was experiencing some stress and I, my diet had slipped a bit. I was eating a lot of bagels. I was doing a lot of stress eating. And so it was time for me, in my opinion, to do a little bit of a reset. And I decided to do a little bit of experimentation. Um, I was reading about the ketogenic diet and I thought I'd give it a try. So I am a naturopathic doctor. I often work with food with my patients. I don't always prescribe diets per se, but we'll always work with food intake. I'll have all my patients do a diet diary, but we'll try and, and tweak things and optimize their nutrient intake. And so I like to experiment with diet to see how food affects my body and see if I can extrapolate that experience to my patients and get that firsthand experience of what it's like to have a more restricted eating regimen and, and see how that sort of plays with my physical and mental and emotional health before I start making recommendations to the people that I work with. Um, and so for me, finding the right nutrition regime has been a process. And that's sort of one of my goals is to find out what works best for me. And does that have any translatability to the people that I work with? In my teens, I kind of did this uh, more, you know, food guide sort of healthy eating plan where I switched out my white breads for whole grain rye bread, focusing more on fiber, and I swipped up, swapped out Jolly Ranchers for carrot sticks. And, um, and then in my early 20s, I slid more into vegetarianism, finally veganism, and then I decided that both of those were not great for my health uh, because I began to experience nutrient deficiencies and weight gain and hormonal issues. So when I was an, a naturopathic student, a lot of my classmates were following the paleo diet that was becoming more popular, and I... So I, I became uh, gluten-free, I experimented with doing an elimination diet. Then I started to do kind of a modified paleo where I'd have whole grains and legumes. Then I experimented with a full-on paleo, taking out the grains and legumes. And then for a while, I kind of slid back to a more modified whole foods paleo diet. And that's probably the best eating style for me, but I'll talk about that later. And so for the most part, I, I focus more on whole foods in my diet personally. And um, I eat lots of vegetables, but in, in 2016 in the fall, I wasn't really following that I was kind of eating like I said more um, high glycemic carb high glycemic carb foods and um, and so I was noticing some health issues that I tend to battle so I think we all have Achilles heels when it comes to our bodies and our health and for me those Achilles heels if I'm not sort of watching my lifestyle and my diet will be more IBS related symptoms PCOS and fatigue and also a little bit of depression as well when I'm really uh, letting things slide. So I was also starting to see some signs of impaired glucose control. So some more of those symptoms of being hangry that I would experience as a kid. And that's another Achilles heel I have is to slide into more um, dysregulated blood sugar symptoms. So I felt like I was in need of a reset and I wanted to see what this keto diet that I've been reading about was all about. 
um, I was interested in seeing how ketone bodies would fuel my body and, and help my mental performance and improve my glucose control through the restriction of carbohydrates. I also have a family, of type, uh, family history of type 2 diabetes, so I wanted to do my part to prevent insulin resistance um, and metabolic syndrome by controlling glucose as best I could. So I began the ketogenic diet. And some background on this diet. So it was developed in the 1920s as a, as a, as a medical diet to treat children with medication-resistant epilepsy. For whatever reason, these kids were not responding to medication or couldn't take medication to control their seizures. And so this diet that basically starves the brain of glucose, which is the brain's preferred fuel source, about 60% of our blood glucose is used up by brain, the brain. But what happens is when we starve our brain of glucose, when we deny it this fuel, our liver takes the fat either from our diet or from our bodies, our stored body fat that we all love so much, and it turns it into something called ketone bodies, which the brain can use as a sort of substitute form of energy. And so this is what makes these diets so attractive to people. This is what people are studying and this is what makes them so interesting. One of these ketone bodies is called beta-hydroxybutyrate, which is thought to be particularly therapeutic for the brain because it has, researchers, researchers were noticing it had some anti-convulsive benefits. And so it was helping to reduce the incidence of seizures in children who didn't respond to medication or who couldn't take medication. However, in the 1920s, this version of the diet was a lot more extreme um, than the general health and weight loss one we see now, where you see people eating a lot of salads and salmon. Uh, in those days, the diet consisted of 90% of the calories coming from fat, right? Which means that you have to very severely restrict your protein intake as well as your carbohydrate intake. And you're essentially eating no carbohydrates at all, very few fruits and vegetables. So most of your food intake is going to be in the form of oils and fats. So this drastically limits nutrition choices. So it's not very attractive and you don't see a lot of cookbooks out there about this classic keto diet. But since then, as this diet is becoming more popular, we're seeing um, beta-hydroxybutyrate being studied for other neurological disorders such as Parkinson's disease, dementia, migra migraine headaches, and narcolepsy, um, as well as mental health conditions like depression or conditions like autism. And then, of course, the metabolic syndrome disorders and metabolic disorders like type 2 diabetes. And then because cancer cells tend to prefer, prefer glucose as a source of fuel, there, there's uh, studies that are looking at using ketogenic diets in conjunction with chemotherapy and radiation to treat cancer. Um, and there are lots of mouse studies looking at its improvement in cognitive function and also some studies in humans as well. So some research in mice is showing that beta-hydroxybutyrate has the potential to expand lifespan or health span. So it doesn't expand the amount of years that somebody lives, but the amount of time that you're healthy throughout your life. Um, and it does this by interacting with the genes that slow aging and beta-hydroxybutyrate can also, um, it's, it's also been shown to confer anti-inflammatory and antioxidant benefits as well. So there's lots of this research coming out about the benefits of beta-hydroxybutyrate, which we can obtain in our body through nutritional ketosis, restricting carbohydrates and increasing fat, uh, or in taking it in the form of exogenous ketones, which I'll mention later on. Then... So we're in the 1920s, we're, we're fast forwarding to the 1970s. A lot of you have heard me talk about how um, the general dietary recommendations of the time, even leading up to now, are telling people to eat less fat and higher carb diets. And so in the, 90, in the 1970s, Dr. Atkins, um, he, so, he was sort of responding to this high carb, low fat dogma of the nutrition world and he brought this modified ketogenic diet onto the market and so this diet involved restricting all forms of carbohydrates and encouraging a consumption of these once vilified foods which are almost still vilified in this day and age um, like bacon eggs and cheese and so what he was showing with this diet although there's problems with the atkins diet of course what he was showing was that people could lose weight by eating fat which is, was something that we just didn't comprehend at the time but they could do that as long as they restricted carbohydrate intake. Now, this modern keto diet is slightly more health conscious, so it promotes more vegetable intake, and, but the current diet still restricts carbohydrates pretty severe, severely. So you're, if you're going to enter ketosis, nutritional ketosis, which is when your, your body is starved of glucose and needs to turn to ketone bodies for fuel, 
Usually you need to keep your carbohydrates under 20 to 50 grams a day, depending on body size and energy demands. And in order to do this, you need to be consuming most of your calories from fats and then keeping your protein intake moderate as protein, when it reaches a certain point, it can also throw you out of ketosis as the body can start to turn proteins into glucose for fuel. So the current version of keto is less strict but it, you still need to be consuming anywhere from 60 to 85% of your calories from fats. And essentially what you need to do is be consuming in a way that makes you enter ketosis. So it may not be, um, there may not be such a recipe for your body. You may need to be testing to see exactly how low you need to go in terms of carbohydrate intake. So my version of keto, when I started this whole thing, um, I started tracking my food intake to see how many carbohydrates I was getting. And I started using my fitness pal to do this. My aim was to consume 20 grams of net carbs or less um, to push my body into using ketone bodies as fuel. Now, net carbs are calculated by subtracting dietary fiber from total carbohydrate grams. So for example, one cup of raw broccoli, it contains about six grams of carbs, but two and a half of those grams are fiber. So the net carbs in broccoli are three and a half grams. Um, and so those three and a half grams would count towards my daily 20 gram of carbohydrate goal, of net carb goal. And you can see that this isn't easy because if you take a look at any package of food you consume, a cup of cooked oatmeal, for example, contains 23 grams of carbs, um, net carbs. And so that's three grams over my entire daily allotment and therefore all high carb foods like grains and legumes and starchy nuts and all fruits and even some starchier vegetables like the kind of vegetables that grow below the ground like carrots and beets were all off limits. And this even means that you have to be careful about nut intake and even vegetables like broccoli because you know the broccoli contains at least three and a half grams of net carbs. So I had to be restricting those kind of foods, which we'll talk about that later, but that's, for, in my experience, it wasn't necessarily healthy for me. So one thing you, you, that they suggest you do is to test your blood or your breath or urine for the presence of ketone bodies that you can determine whether or not you're actually in ketosis and then you can arrange your carbohydrate intake depending on that. So I dabbled in this. Um, I didn't have a, a blood test because it was too expensive, but I started using the urinalysis strips that I have in my clinic to test urine and I was looking at urinary ketone levels. But what happens to a lot of people is that they'll test negative for ketones even though their carbohydrate intake is low. So there's a few reasons why ketone strips may not be a reliable marker for ketosis. Firstly, they don't look at beta hydroxybutyrate, which is the ketone body that we're actually interested in producing and the one that we use by the brain, uh, but they test for another ketone body called acetoacetate, which is also produced in the liver um, and, and not as beneficial to pro providing energy for the body. And the second thing is that when ketone bodies are entering our urine, it's essentially a spillover. So these are the ketone bodies that we don't need anymore and that we're not using. So they don't necessarily reflect our blood levels. If you're using up all the ketone bodies that you're producing, you're not gonna have a lot of spillover into the urine and so you may test negative even though you're in ketosis. So, um, so there were some reasons why I was testing negative. Um, and so the, the more accurate way is to do a blood test, to do a skin prick test and then assess your, your blood for levels of beta hydroxybutyrate. However, that's more expensive. And so I knew that these urine strips weren't accurate uh, or highly accurate, but it was also discouraging to not have this state of ketosis validated by some external measure. So I was often left in doubt about whether things were working. And then I was starting to doubt whether I was eating too many carbs, even though I was staying under the number that I decided. Um, and then I was wondering if there was some other mechanism going on that we hadn't fully figured out yet as um, a, a medical research community like perhaps my gut bacteria were finding a way to turn the fiber I was eating that I wasn't counting towards my net carbs into uh, blood glucose. Um, you know, so this can happen in someone perhaps with small intestinal bacteria overgrowth, which is an overgrowth of the beneficial bacteria that goes from the colon to the small intestine and can cause a lot of symptoms of IBS. Um, or I was wondering, you know, were these blood ketones being absorbed by some of these gut bacteria, for example, yeast, which have mitochondria and therefore can use ketone bodies. So if people are experiencing a yeast overgrowth or if they have the potential to experience dysbiosis from yeast in the intestine, they can potentially be feeding that by 
um, by getting into ketosis or following a ketogenic diet. So there are some other signs you can look for though. So when I avoid carbs for a few days, I start to develop this metallic taste on the tip of my tongue, uh, which is not a super common sign. A more common sign is this, um, it's like a nail polish remover, paint thinner taste on the back of your tongue, which is wonderfully pleasant. Um, and that's from acetone being released in the breath. So acetone is another ketone body. Another thing that I experienced was keto flu. So during the first few days of switching to low, heart, low carb, high fat, um, I had to white knuckle through this phase that people term the keto or low carb flu. Um, this is a horrible phenomenon. And it's thought to be the result of the body switching from burning glucose as its primary fuel source to adapting to ketone body production and for the brain, the mitochondria in brain cells to be um, learning how essentially to utilize these ketone bodies as fuel. It's like when you're switching from gas to electricity in a hybrid car. So there's often this painful adjustment period for brains that have to learn how to re rely on ketones for the first time after a lifetime of glucose abundance. And so this was super nasty for me. I had intense hunger and sugar cravings. I was nauseous, I was dizzy, and I was weak. And it, it really does deserve the term flu. It did feel like a flu. I knew that um, I'd spent most of my life, if not all of my life, as a sugar burner. So living on glucose for energy. Before doing this diet, I'd crave food just two hours after a full meal. I'd often feel hangry which is this feeling of being dizzy and shaky in between meals and irritable if made to wait for food for too long. These are all signs of reactive hypoglycemia when high blood glucose spikes after eating are suppressed by um, a large spike in insulin that again drops blood sugar and causes these hypoglycemic symptoms, even though you've just eaten. Um, so essentially my whole life I was living, I was existing between carb dense meals um, and experiencing these like insanity inducing reactive hypoglycemia symptoms between my regular sugar fixes. So I read about others' experiences and I was kind of assured that these keto flu symptoms were actually a sign of my body healing perhaps because I was becoming adapted to other fuel sources, not just sugar, and I thought that was a good thing. So one of these terms is metabolically, metabolic flexibility. So being able to switch from sugar to fat burning seamlessly without experiencing this crash in between. So I muscled through this keto flu and followed the advice that I was reading about online, which was consume more, pro more fat to provide more fuel for the brain. And uh, that includes medium chain triglyceride oil, which is quickly absorbed by the lymphatic system and turned into ketone bodies rather quickly by the brain. I also consumed electrolytes, which are more rapidly excreted from the body of low carb dieters. And so I was consuming a lot more sea salt and some potassium salt as well. So for some people, this keto flu can last for days and for others, it lasts even weeks. And I've even heard in some extreme cases months, but for me, thankfully, despite this history of um, reactive hypoglycemia and sugar burning, I was, um, it only lasted for about two days. And after that, my body began to adjust and my cravings for sugar went down and I started to feel more energy. And then I started to feel encouraged by this whole ex experiment that I was doing. So my daily meals essentially look like uh, a breakfast of a kind of high fat smoothie. I like smoothies in the morning. And so I was making keto smoothies. I'd take um, coconut milk yogurt that I have a recipe on my blog for that if you're interested. I'd add some gelatin to that, which is a, a essentially zero carb, pure protein source. I'd add some more fat in the form of avocado. Maybe I'd add some pumpkin seeds and cacao to get a bit of crunch going. And I had to be careful because the carbs start adding up at that point when you're adding in pumpkin seeds and avocado. Um, sometimes I'd make fat bombs or I'd make um, my unsweetened chocolate that's essentially like a fat bomb. And then that would keep me full for a while. So my second meal of the day would be around 2 to 3 p.m. That would, that would be when I'd start to get hungry after I'd stopped um, absorbing and utilizing the calories from fat from that first meal. And then around 2 to 3 p.m. I'd eat some kind of uh, vegetable, like a cruciferous vegetable. So I really like broccoli and cabbage. Uh, and then I'd have a fatty cut of meat with it, like ground beef, chicken thighs, or, or a fatty fish like salmon. And then I'd top all of that with liberal amounts of fat from coconut oil, olives, avocado, and grass-fed ghee. And so I'd make a lot of these batch cooked grain-free curries and stews, and I'd have that. So I'd pack this small, little, really nutrient and calorie-dense 
lunch and that would essentially be all the food I need to bring to work that day. And if I had a third meal or snack, it'd be maybe another serving of fat. So maybe a handful of macadamia nuts, which are very rich in monounsaturated fats, um, or a hunk of creamed coconut like that. Um, it's just like a hunk of coconut meat and oil and I'd have some of that. So eating this way was kind of cool. It made me feel like Obama in his gray suits. Like I didn't have to plan my meals too carefully. All I had to do was eat fat and that just kept me going. So my food was so calorie dense and my blood sugar was so stable that I didn't need to eat often. Um, and this meant that I didn't need to worry about bringing food with me everywhere I went and one meal could satiate me for basically half the day. Like if I'd eat at seven, I wouldn't be hungry and well until two or 3 p.m. And hunger was never an emergency situation. It would come on very slowly and it would never feel like hanger. Um, my already low blood sugar, which was very stable, had nowhere to dip to. So if I needed more food, I'd, I'd always just, I could always just wait until I got home to eat. So um, hunger would be something that would just happen so gradually that I could wait to eat for another three hours if I needed to, which was completely different to how I lived my life previously. Um, and some other benefits I noticed initially in the first few months of the diet was that some of my PCOS related cystic acne cleared up. Um, and then I felt sort of lighter and slimmer as some water retention deflated. And this feels pretty good, right? When we feel light, it's like, it, you know, we, I felt less heavy. I felt less foggy. Um, and this is probably because our body stores carbohydrates in the form of muscle glycogen. Um, and that's in the muscles and in the liver and glycogen retains water with it. So when we use up glycogen, which would have happened pretty quickly on at the beginning of this diet, once we burn through our blood glucose, we turn to our glycogen stores. And with that, a rapid five or more pound drop of water weight can occur. And this is what people talk about, about when they talk about losing a bunch of water weight at the beginning of any kind of nutrition plan. But it's also common to notice a drop in water weight when inflammation levels decrease. So I know that I'm sensitive to certain carbs and dairy. And because I had cut those things out of my diet as well, I was noticing um, some water retention decrease as inflammation also decreased. So it wasn't necessarily the keto diet per se that was, put, that was helping me feel lighter. Um, it could have also just been the fact that I wasn't eating a lot of things that I was sensitive to. And so although it's worth mentioning, although it seems to attract a lot of people for its hip slimming potential, its weight loss potential, the ketogenic diet probably doesn't cause weight loss in and of itself. So instead, the diet encourages a passive reduction in calories by stabilizing blood sugar and insulin levels while promoting the intake of highly satiating foods containing protein and fat that keep you satiated for longer so you're less likely to snack, adding calories into your diet that way. Ketone bodies also have appetite suppressing effects. So um, it's probably a calorie deficiency that causes the weight loss rather than anything specific in the biochemistry of burning fat for fuel. Um, especially if you're getting enough calories to, from dietary fat, um, you're probably not going to be losing weight. Um, and this is, you know, and then also, you know, the number one foods consumed in North America are bread, sugar, sugary, sort of like flour based desserts and pizza. So when you cut those foods out of your diet, which you have to do by following this, you're probably going to lose some weight and you start replacing those carbs with something like broccoli, for example, and coconut oil. So I didn't lose personally much weight other than the water weight. So that's worth saying because a lot, a lot of people are attracted to this diet because they think it's a magical recipe for weight loss. Um, but I did notice that my mood was brighter. I'd wake up in the morning kind of uplifted and ready for the day. And that often doesn't happen to me in the winter time where I was really in the heat of this diet. And I felt a lot more sustained energy throughout the day. And I really enjoyed the decreased appetite because I felt more productive and I didn't have to stop and snack or think about what I was bringing and I didn't have to worry about getting hangry. So I stopped feeling anxious around the feeling of hunger uh, because it didn't have a negative experience associated with it anymore. Um, I also felt fine consuming two meals a day. I was able to get through hours of back-to-back -back patient visits without needing a snack or a break. And it was actually incredible to need so few meals. It was like being another person. Um, one no longer ruled by sugar cravings. And so I was like joking with my friends and family, like I'm like a camel, like I, I literally just carry my fuel around with me in the form of stored body fat. And I just switch from, um, from dietary fuel to store fuel um, after my last meal runs out and the transition feels seamless because it's the same fuel, it's fat. 
And so there was no wall to hit and no hypoglycemic crash, which was really nice. And I felt less bloated and had less digestive issues. And this is probably just from the lack of fermentation in my gut and reduction in foods that tend to aggravate IBS, like certain vegetables, fruit, and legumes, termed FODMAPs. These are fermentable fibers that are found in very healthy foods, but if somebody has IBS, that can trigger a lot of gas and bloating. And so when you're decreasing carbohydrates in general, you're also going to be decreasing a lot of these FODMAPs. However, it wasn't all roses on the keto diet. So now we're going to get into that part of it. Um, the first few months were, were great and dreamy, and I was like wondering if I was just going to do this forever. But the longer I stayed on it, the more I started to notice changes in my body that indicated that this honeymoon period wasn't probably going to last. And that can happen with a lot of restrictive diets. When we start pushing our body's biochemistry, there'll be adaptations that we start to see, and those won't always feel that great. So first of all, the microbiome. So the research is in. Human beings probably need about 10 servings of fruits and vegetables a day, uh, about five cups or 800 grams to get the most heart disease, stroke, and cancer preventing benefits that diet can afford us. You start to see there's not much benefit when you're eating one or two servings and once, and then once you get up to about 10 servings a day, that has the most disease protective and health protective benefits. The International Journal of Epidemiolog Epidemiology concluded that if the correlations found in their February 2017 study were causal, almost 8 million lives might have been saved in the year 2013 when they did this study. Um, if everyone in the world at the time had simply consumed enough fruits and vegetables. So 8 million diet related deaths from a lack of fruit and vegetable consumption was what they concluded. Of course, like I say before, correlation doesn't equal causation, but the caveat to their conclusions were if the relationship that they found was causal. So it's one thing that all diets, even the fatty-ish kind of uh, fad diets agree on. So even from the paleo peeps to the plant-based hippies to the raw macrobiotic sun worshippers to whole foods people like Michael Pollan to the dejected, <laughs> thanks for the like, to the dejected, de dejected nagged at husband pushing Brussels sprouts around on his plate. Fruits and vegetables are good for you. You should eat them. And if you're a typical North American, you should probably eat more than you're eating. So the health value of everything else we eat seems to be up for debate. So people will complain or there'll be debates about red meat consumption, saturated fat consumption, soy, is that good for us? Is it killing us? Bread, everyone's getting rid of their gluten. Coffee, is that healthy? Is it not healthy? But the benefits of eating fruits and vegetables are really, there's no contest. Everybody agrees that those are good for us. It's hard to pick one way in which they're so health protective. It could be because of their high concentrations of micronutrients, reducing the risk of common nutrient deficiencies like magnesium and vitamin C that many people experience deficiencies in, you know, uh, functional deficiencies especially. It could be because if you're filling your body with a kilogram of fruits and vegetables a day, you probably aren't scarfing down an entire medium-sized pizza and super-sized orange pop as well. Maybe you're having a couple slices and a big salad on the side. Um, there just isn't room, so it's also about what you're not eating that makes them so protective. It could also be the antioxidants that they contain that protect cells against free radical damage, uh, protecting our DNA from mutations, or perhaps it's the fermentable fibers present in the fruits and vegetables that feed our microbiome. So the problem I had with keeping my net carbs under 20 grams a day was that I really did need to restrict my fruit and vegetable intake. So I was eating absolutely no fruit at all, and I was staying away from the starchier veggies like any kind of tubers, any kind of carrots, parsnips, or uh, beets which have higher carbohydrate intake um, or content, sorry. I still stuck to my beloved leafy greens and cruciferous vegetables, which are lower carb, but even eating two to three cups of those a day would push me to the upper limits of my carb intake. And this meant that I couldn't eat them as liberally as I had been, or I just wasn't thinking about it. Getting enough fruits, uh, enough vegetables and getting any fruits on the ketogenic diet is hard, if not impossible. This can impact our ability to get the micronutrients we need, but also to get enough of the fermentable fibers from vegetables like garlic, onions, yams, Jerusalem artichokes, and legumes, which provide food for our microbiome. So feeding our gut bugs is important. They benefit us in numerous ways, from digesting our food, to calming inflammation, to fueling gut cells by producing a short chain fatty acid called butyrate, um, and they help our immune systems function optimally. They produce neurotransmitters for our brains to work properly. 
they balance our stress responses and our circadian rhythms. And um, there's a man called Jeff Leach at the Human Microbiome Project that speculates that the lack of dietary fiber in most low carb diets may impact the health of the microbiome um, in, negatively by depriving the gut bacteria of their preferred f- food source, which is fiber. And it also can alter the acidity in the colon and the intestines, which can encourage certain bacteria to proliferate that we don't necessarily want and other beneficial bacteria to die. He cites an article, which you can look at in the original, uh, in my article that I linked to, um, and in which, in which he found obese subjects on a high protein and high and low carb diet had lower levels of butyrate in their bodies and in their intestines. And this is likely due to the decreased diversity in their gut. So they had less friendly gut bacteria producing butyrate for them. And this has uh, widespread health effects down the line. It's not all pointing in that direction though, because there are some studies that suggest that a ketogenic diet can actually improve the microbiome. There's two studies, one in children with epilepsy and one in children with autism that show that um, it actually improved the guts of these kids. And there was even some speculation by the researchers in the discussion that this may be how the diets treat these conditions. However, these studies were not done on healthy children um, with an already healthy microbiome. And so it's hard to extrapolate those findings to the healthy adult population. So maybe that these kids already had some dysbiosis and the keto diet sort of starved out some of those bad bacteria. Um, or we don't know what the, what the baseline diet, what the control diet was for these kids either. It could be a hybrid, sort of high sugar diet. Then there's the fact that most studies that look at high fat diets and their impact on the microbiome are mostly done in rats. And of course, rats and humans are not the same animal, but we do have some genetic similarities. Um, and often in these animal studies, when researchers refer to a high fat diet, What they in fact mean is a high fat, high sugar diet, which is not a ketogenic diet. The sources of fat in these high fat mouse diets as well are often corn or margarine or soy oil or lard. And we know that these uh, fats tend to be more inflammatory and they offer few health benefits. So going on a whole foods keto diet may not be the same as the diet that these mice are put on. In other words, many studies on high fat diets are not looking at a relatively balanced ketogenic diet that consists of vegetables, proteins, and healthy sources of fats from avocados, coconut, fish oils, nuts and seeds, and grass fed meats. And it's also important to understand the context. So is it the high fat diet that causes the reduction in gut diversity or is it the absence of fiber? So is it the fat that's, that's, um, that's harmful or is it the, uh, the deficiency in fiber that's harmful? There is a mouse study that shows that providing mice with fiber in addition to their high fat diet, which remember is a high fat, high sugar diet, um, actually decreased their risk of obesity. So it, it was protective in a sense, even though their diet was still pretty crappy. Um, I felt that my gut improved initially in the first few months on the ketogenic diet um, because I noticed that it was low in foods that t- tend to aggravate me, so refined carbs and sugar and gluten, and then I took out dairy as well. And then some of those fermentable fibers that can aggravate IBS were also out of my diet. However, I never fully felt healed, so after a few months I started to notice some symptoms coming back. Um, and so an interesting thing to note is that candida, which is a yeast that resides in the gut of most people and has the potential to overgrow in the intestines, especially those who are immunocompromised, Um, can cause symptoms and it causes like a ton of different symptoms such as fatigue or bloating and weight gain and rashes, um, vaginal yeast infections among a variety of other symptoms. Um, And candida, because it's a yeast, it has mitochondria so it can survive on ketone bodies. So some, also there are some species of gut bacteria that are pathogenic that can consume protein. And there are some species of gut bacteria that consume bile salts, which are increased when your fat intake increases. You produce more bile salts into your small intestine. And then there's some bacteria that can feast on fats. So contrary to what many people claim, a ketogenic diet doesn't necessarily starve out bad gut bugs. Um, Combined with a lack of fiber to feed the beneficial gut bacteria and promote more bacterial diversity, a prolonged ketogenic diet may be actually a recipe for gut dysbiosis, but it completely depends on the individual. Then there were the hormonal impacts. So throughout my year that I spent on keto, I definitely noticed an, improve, an improvement in my insulin signaling and my glucose, 
glucose control, and that happened pretty quickly, especially in the first few months. I noticed this dramatic shift, like I mentioned before. Um, I did blood work in March of this year, and that was after I'd done a full year on the ketogenic diet, then traveled in Southeast Asia where I was eating a lot of rice and, and like Thai food with sugar added, and then having sort of just come back off the keto diet and returned to a more modified paleo diet. And so I did blood work at that time, and my fasting insulin was very low despite eating more carbohydrates and not being in ketosis. And my fast, fasting blood glucose levels were also in the low optimal range. A calculation called HOMA IR, H O M A IR, which can be a marker for insulin resistance, and it's used calculating fasting insulin and fasting glucose and looks at how resistant your cells are to insulin. Um, it was also really low and that indicated good insulin sensitivity and I often don't see that in my patients when I look at that marker in their blood. So that was really great to see. Um, so I personally believe that this means that my risk for getting metabolic syndrome and type 2 diabetes has, has decreased, but I have to still maintain this level of insulin sensitivity by watching the glycemic load of my food and by managing my stress levels and sleep are two other big aspects to insulin control and blood sugar regulation. Um, the, metabolic, the metabolic flexibility awarded to me from this year in ketosis, I think was invaluable. Uh, I no longer fear, fear fasting and I feel confident that my body can survive on other fuel sources besides sugar and carbohydrates. Um, my brain now knows how to tap into stored and dietary fat more efficiently and to use those for energy. When I want to go back into ketosis, I don't go through that keto flu anymore. I might feel hungry for a few hours and then I notice a, a smoother transition. So even when I'm not following any sort of low carb diet, I notice I can survive between meals. And so this actually came in handy when I was in Southeast Asia. I could just eat when people I was traveling with were ready to eat or when I found food that I wanted to eat. And whereas before when traveling, I would have always stopped at convenience stores and picked up some high sugar food snacks and stuff. So I didn't snack at all when I was traveling. It was good for the budget and good for my health as well. Um, and But after a few months on the ketogenic diet, I began to notice other hormonal symptoms that I didn't like. So I began to notice a decline in my menstrual health. It's a little bit personal, but we'll go on. My cycles began to get longer and I soon started missing periods. And I noticed a lot of hair falling out in the shower. And then actually what I noticed was while at the beginning of the diet, my cystic acne decreased and my skin cleared up, I was starting to notice some acne start to occur again. And so I ran a hormonal panel. I, I ordered a blood test to look at my estrogen and progesterone levels. And I was surprised to see both of them were very low, including my estrogen, which was undetectable, was very low. Um, and so one thing that we know is that insulin, which is often vilified as a fat storage hormone, is actually responsible for storing everything. And that includes nutrients. It also correlates with estrogen levels. So low estrogen, low insulin can encourage estrogen levels to be low. And insulin is also needed to convert T4, one of our thyroid hormones, to T3, which is the active thyroid hormone that regulates our metabolism. Insulin builds muscle and bone and brain cells. It's um, responsible for increasing brain-derived neurotrophic factor, which increases the building of new brain cells and helps with memory and cognition. And so in my case, I was noticing some effects of having chronically low insulin, and that was, uh, was contributing to amenorrhea and disruption in my menstrual cycles and low sex hormones, and that wasn't good. So that wasn't cool. Um, so I started to look at the research to figure out what's going on and then immediately on my carb intake. Um, so while not the same as intermittent fasting, keto is often grouped into the same category because of its similar impact on blood glucose and insulin levels. The difference is that intermittent fasting induces ketosis through periodic food restriction as opposed to carb restriction. And intermittent fasting, there's many different variations of it. I always recommend, or I often recommend a 12-12 fast to most patients, like you eat for 12 hours during the day, uh, and then you stop eating for 12 hours during the day. And that is pretty, like, that's pretty light on your hormones. It's more beneficial than risky. Um, but then some versions of intermittent fasting are, you know, fasting 23 hours a day and just eating one meal or skipping breakfast, that, that kind of thing. Um, Keto and IF go hand in hand. 
Karina says hello. Hi, Karina. <laughs> Welcome. Um, so the reduced hunger and high nutrient density of the foods eaten on the ketogenic diet often lend well to practicing intermittent fasting. So in my case, it did. I had breakfast and then I had like a later lunch slash dinner. So it was basically two main meals a day. And I always found it interesting though, that the proponents, the proponents of intermittent fasting are often men. And when I, you know, read research or read, um, or listen to podcasts or listen to people talk about intermittent fasting, ketogenic diets, they'll talk about how, you know, when, when people fast, they get this boost of growth hormone, um, which, you know, puts on muscle and helps with brain cell neuro, like, um, neurogenesis. And they also get this boost of norepinephrine, which improves their energy. And so there's like this thriving that happens in a fasted state. And both of these, like if, you know, both of these um, hormones that are boosted during a fasted state and provide people with energy motivation and an improved sense of well-being. So there's a lot of praise for these kind of fasting diets to get that hormonal effect. And it makes sense if you think about our hunter-gatherer ancestors, if you are deprived of food, if there's this food scarcity, then there's a benefit to rather than being demotivated and sort of feeling depressed and hibernating to get this burst of energy and motivation so that you go and hunt and find food and you can keep on living. You don't die of starvation. Um, but this makes sense in male bodies. I don't know if, I mean, it could happen in female bodies as well, but just theoretically, I don't think female bodies may experience the same effect. And some preliminary animal research tends to suggest this as well. So there are a few rat studies on just female rats that found that fasting may impair female insulin sensitivity. So rather than improving insulin sensitivity, it actually made it worse. And then they also noticed that there was a study that showed that fasting induced amenorrhea or lack of menstrual cycles in female rats. Um, so female bodies rely on a consistent influx of calories and carbohydrates to stimulate insulin, which plays a role in stimulating thyroid hormones and estrogen, which allows us to continue to ovulate. Um, the, the fat, the stress from fasting or low carb may actually impair ovulation because your body's like, well, if there's a food scarcity, I'm not going to ovulate and risk bringing, you know, a pregnancy, which is going to require even more nutrients. Another study showed that fasting tended to masculinize female rats. So it lowered their female sex hormones and it actually increased their levels of androgens, the male sex hormones like testosterone. Um, of course, these studies are done in fasted rats, and so we can't fully translate the effects of intermittent fasting and ketogenic diets onto human women. Um, but some of these findings did validate my experience, and it wasn't being validated by some of the podcasts and blog posts I was reading, and some of the studies I was looking at, which were, you know, I have to admit, written largely by men and followed by men. Um, of course there's women that do ketogenic diets and intermittent fasting, but it was mostly men that were praising it. Um, but I did experience positive hormonal effects. So while there were that study that showed that the female rats in increased their insulin um, resistance after fasting, I did notice increased insulin sensitivity and lower blood glucose. And those, those actually lasted when I returned to eating more carbohydrates. Um, but I was not happy about irregular cycles and estrogen deficiency. So I decided, decided to increase my carb intake and I returned to this more sort of moderate paleo diet where I was adding more fruit in, starchier vegetables and legumes like chickpeas. And after a few months, my periods returned to normal. Uh, my skin cleared up and my hair stopped falling out. Yay. <laughs> and my thyroid hormones and estrogen and progesterone, when I retested them, they were all in optimal ranges. Um, but I still had low fasting insulin levels. So that's kind of cool. Um, so it suggests that the keto diet maybe did help reset my insulin sensitivity and that this effect may be lasting and that maybe it wasn't the low insulin or even the keto diet that caused this hormonal change. Um, it could have also been the keto diet combined with lifestyle stress, uh, high stress perception that was related to other things. Um, and then there were effects on my metabolic health. So after a year of doing the ketogenic diet, and then a few months of returning to a sort of moderate carb paleo diet. Um, and after a few months of traveling where I was eating rice and whatever I wanted, um, I tested my cholesterol levels and inflammatory markers. And so what, so I looked at my cholesterol and my HDL cholesterol, which is the good cholesterol to put it very simply without going into more detail was uh, very high. So it was 2.73 um, millimoles per liter, the Canadian units. 
and my triglycerides, which are one of the bigger risk factors for heart disease, were low, 0.44. And my LDL cholesterol, which is like the bad cholesterol that we talk about, that this is the cholesterol that statin drugs target, was pretty low. So it was 1.71. Um, and my inflammatory markers, C-reactive protein and erythrocyte sedimentation rate were also very, very low. Um, and so this kind of makes sense. Like a lot of people were shocked when I shared this on Facebook because we think of a high fat diet as increasing our cholesterol levels in, 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 neg in a negative way, like increasing our LDL and our triglycerides. But Actually, monounsaturated fats like olive oils and avocados are associated with increased levels of the heart protective HDL cholesterol. And even some saturated fats like fats from coconut oil can raise HDL. LDL though is often, so LDL is lowered by these fats, these healthy monounsaturated fats, um, but some saturated fats, even the healthier ones can raise LDL. There's some studies that show coconut oil can raise your LDL, but then there's a study I linked to in my site that says it lowered it when compared to butter. So we're st the jury's still out on exactly how saturated fat affects our lipid values. But it actually, so I mean, following the keto diet where I was eating tons of olives and coconut and avocados and having these blood lipid results make sense actually uh, from what we know about the research. And that being said, all else being equal, higher levels of LDL cholesterol, the bad, this so-called bad cholesterol, it may not be as big of a risk factor as we think, like especially in the context of low lifestyle risk factors like having low inflammation, um, not smoking and having a healthy body weight um, and having normal blood pressure. They may it may not confer as big of a risk as we previously thought. Um, also, triglycerides and the cholesterol to HDL ratio may be more important factors for determining our heart disease risk. Um, so. Another thing you can also look at is LDL particle size that may, pro that may provide those who are concerned about their LDL levels with more information regarding their cardiovascular health. So the bigger our LDL and the fluffier it is, the less it is likely to contribute to atherosclerosis or forming these plaques that can cause heart disease. That being said, it's important to be aware um, that some of the fats present in a ketogenic diet have the potential to raise our blood levels of LDL in certain susceptible individuals as well, right? So there's some genetic variability that can cause you to be more susceptible to saturated fats, raising your LDL levels. And so not everyone's blood lipid levels are gonna look like mine. Although, you know, most people could benefit probably from increasing their monounsaturated fat intake. Uh, triglyceride levels as well, they're not really associated with fat intake. Um, they're associated with, uh, you know, liver function. So higher triglycerides and high fatty liver, they kind of correlate. And they generally reflect dietary sugar intake, so especially fructose and refined carb intake rather than the fat intake of our diet. So reducing refined dietary carbohydrates like white grains, flours, and sugars is, is actually a good strategy for reducing triglycerides and reducing heart disease risk. So actually the keto diet it, and having those blood levels makes sense. Um, it wasn't actually that crazy to see, but it's kind of cool to see that your blood lipid levels can improve um, just eating tons of fat all the time. However, so I had good blood results in that regard, but some individuals can experience elevated levels of inflammation on a ketogenic diet, and that depends on the quality of fats that they consume. A ketogenic diet low in fiber that fails to feed the microbiome um, could increase inflammation just because you don't have that production of butyrate that's anti-inflammatory. And also a ketogenic diet high in foods that a person may have a sensitivity to, so if someone's eating a lot of eggs and dairy, um, or nuts or even soy, and they're sensitive to that, that can contribute to inflammation. Um, or a diet that's high in inflammatory fats like trans fats, or those industrial oils like canola and corn oil could all contribute to increased inflammation. Or certain types of factory farmed meat, eating a lot of fat from those um, animals that have experienced that. And so that being said, certain ketone bodies like beta hydroxybutyrate also uh, have been shown to have some anti-inflammatory properties so, um, and, and then many of the fats consumed in a mindful whole foods ketogenic diet, such as olives and avocado and seeds and salmon and coconut are anti-inflammatory. So it can go both ways. It can be very anti-inflammatory or it can be pro-inflammatory depending on your individual food choices. It's not the, how the diet is set up that will guarantee an increase or decrease in inflammation per se. 
Um, so, you know, personally, I found that my blood markers were a good indicator of the power of a high fat, low carb diet to, um, at least in my case, improve HDL and lower triglycerides and lower fasting insulin and lower fasting glucose levels. Um, but it's not clear whether I actually needed to be on that diet for an entire year um, or whether I actually even needed to enter ketosis to receive these benefits. Perhaps I could have just gotten the same results by moderately lowering my refined or my carb intake, but eliminating my refined carbs and increasing dietary um, healthy fats. And so of course, this is like an N of one study, right? This is an anecdote. This is why we don't, we can't extrapolate conclusions from my experience because we don't know all of the other factors that are involved in what I experience. Um, and so something though to think about, so, you know, you think about doing an entire year of a ketogenic diet to get some of these benefits that I experienced, there may be some benefit to doing a more modified ketogenic diet. So I think I did benefit from entering ketosis and I plan to, you know, go in and out of ketosis later on in my life, like periodically. Um, but I wouldn't really recommend a ketogenic diet to my patients unless to achieve some sort of therapeutic goal. So such as improved insulin resistance or for adjunct cancer care maybe, or to reduce inflammation or to improve severe depression, migraines or narcolepsy um, or for epilepsy, right? So if someone has a very um, severe condition that they're dealing with where a ketogenic diet can help, a more severe intervention can help, that might be appropriate. But for the average person, wants to get healthier, lose weight, improve their blood lipid levels, I don't think it would be on my top list of recommendations. Um, but there may be a benefit to cyclical ketogenic diets. So for both memory and cognition and increased lifespan in, in mice, they've done some studies in mice showing this. And cyclical ketogenic diets involve entering ketosis on alternate, on alternate weeks. So on one week you do a keto diet and on the other week you go back to eating your whole foods diet that has um, higher amounts of carbohydrate and fiber. And so in this case, individuals get the benefit of beta hydroxybutyrate production on one week and increased metabolic flexibility but they're also able to eat a higher amount of fermentable carbs and fibers on their weeks off. So they essentially get the best of both worlds. There was also this really cool study that I heard about from uh, Chris Masterjohn, um, this researcher, and it shows that maybe adding medium chain triglycerides to food may also confer health benefits. So similar to being on a ketogenic diet, um, and so Karina asks, do you find keto diets benefit or harm patients with adrenal fatigue? Right. Well, well okay. I'll, I'll, I'll address that at the end. Okay, Karina. Um, cause there's some, there's some debate about that. And then Liz asks, hi Talia, I would like to stop using brand buds for fiber. Which foods provide high fiber? Okay. We'll talk about that one too. All right. So, um, so this one study that Chris Masterjohn talked about in his podcast was um, that similar to being on a ketogenic diet, if you add MCT oil, medium chain triglyceride oil from coconut to your food, you may get similar health benefits to being in some sort of mild ketosis. So it reduces appetite. And it's likely because that burning, so like, so these men ate a breakfast full of pasta and then they put MCT oil in the sauce. So tons of carbs and then some MCT oil and it reduced their appetite. They had their lunch a lot later than the control group. And this is probably because after burning through the glucose in the pasta, the brain in the brains of these men then started to burn the ketone bodies from the MCT oil. And so this kept their brains fueled and their bodies saturated for longer. It was like this like abundant, you know, jackpot for the brain where they got a ton of glucose, you got all this pasta, and then you got all these ketone bodies that you could burn. And then they didn't need to ask the, their, these participants for fuel until much later on in the day. Um, the men eating the pasta and MCT oil in the study also achieved a blood ketone level of 0.3. This is similar to that obtained from a diet that derives 10% of its calories from carbs. Um, so in one study, participants were getting 10% of their calories from carbs. Their blood ketone level was 0.2. So just adding MCT oil to pasta can actually give you more ketone bodies, more beta hydroxybutyrate than if you're uh, restricting carbs. However, 10% of carbs from, uh, of calories from carbs is not necessarily a ketogenic diet and having a blood ketone level of 0.3 is not being in ketosis, but you are producing ketone bodies, which are giving your brain a different source of fuel and more fuel. 
But 10% of calories from carbs is very low carb, like you're tracking your carbs and you're trying to restrict carbs. So it may indicate that simply adding MCT to um, a moderate or low carb diet may confer some of the benefits of having a slightly higher rate of circulating ketone bodies without having to follow a strict diet. Again, if you follow this strategy, you can kind of get the best of both worlds. You can consume a diet high in fiber, so not necessarily pasta, but some good healthy fibers, while also getting a steady flow of ketone bodies to the brain and getting some of those anti-inflammatory benefits. And other areas of research are the use of supplemental or exogenous ketones for therapeutic use. Um, but this area is new and it's not something I currently recommend or know too much about. There's some products on the market, but they're not that promising, at least in my, um, to my knowledge. Um, and th so this hopefully may change when research begins to emerge and better supplements start to enter the market. And so my plan moving forward, what I took from this, because this is all about me, <laughs> But hopefully you can get something. Hopefully you can you know see how this might apply to you, or get some information about what keto is and whether it's this amazing diet that everyone's talking about. And they're showing their before and after shots in bikinis. Um, but my personal plan moving forward is I'm happy that I gave this diet a try. Uh, but now I'm back to a more modified paleo diet. So I'm and my goals for eating right now are to promote my gut health, to optimize my micronutrient, vitamin and mineral intake to regulate my hormones at this time in my life and to uh, support my energy levels and cognition. And so I consume berries and apples and legumes and starchier vegetables like carrots and lean proteins uh, more often. And I aim to get the 10 f servings of fruits and vegetables or more a day because I want to live forever. Um, and eight to nine of those servings come from vegetables as opposed to fruits. But I do eat fruit every day. And I currently start my smoothie, my day with a, with a smoothie, just like before, but this time I add berries and avocado, spinach and protein powder. So not as much fat, a little bit more carb. And for lunch, I'll have like a sort of protein fat and lots of veggies. So it, this is not a ketogenic diet, but it's similar in structure. It's just a lot more vegetables, a little bit less um, of the fat and some more, more protein. So I definitely eat more than when I was in ketosis. I need to eat at least three meals a day and I need a vegetable and fat as a snack or no snack at all um, uh, in between my meals. It depends on my schedule. And my total uh, dietary carbohydrate intake tends to fall around 100 grams a day and the net carbs are around 50 to 70 grams a day. So there's about um, 30 to 40 grams coming from fiber and that's just eating my fruits and vegetables. So maybe that will answer your question, Liz, asking what are alternative sources of fiber? And I'll talk a little bit more about what you can do, but one great source of fiber, ground flax seeds. I add two tablespoons to my smoothie a day. Um, and fruits and vegetables, like lots of fresh fruits and vegetables, um, getting your 10 servings, so your five cups of fruits and vegetables a day will bump up your fiber intake. But I'll tell you how you can track your fiber intake to see how much you're actually getting. So my goal is to get about 30 grams of fiber a day. Um, and then I, I continue to avoid all sugar. I don't eat um, sweeter fruits. Like I try to avoid more tropical fruits and, and dried fruits and dates and things like that. And I definitely stay away from refined sugars, even sort of like the natural sugars, because it's still essentially, it's not processed, but it essentially ends up just being sugar. Our rapidly absorbed in the body, rapidly, abs rapidly absorbed in the gut, doesn't feed our gut bacteria properly. Um, so even those natural sugars like coconut sugars and agave, I don't really eat those. I avoid processed carbs and flours. I mostly avoid grains, uh, except when I'm traveling or someone's offering me them and I'm at their house uh, and I have no other options. <laughs> and uh, so I get my carbohydrates from starchy vegetables and tubers and legumes and berries. And I continue to avoid the foods I'm sensitive to. So dairy and gluten in my case. And then I also stay away from those processed industrial oils like canola, corn, and soy oil. And um, that's not as easy as you think because even though you don't cook with them or have them in your house, they're in everything that's packaged that contains oil and they're in all restaurant foods, including salads, and they're in all packaged salad dressings. Um, so right now, rather than focusing on macronutrients, the, car the uh, fiber or the carbs and the fat and the protein, I'm actually focusing more on my micronutrients. Those are the vitamins and minerals that run all of our cellular reactions. And, um, and I'm also focusing on fiber intake. And so what you can do, if you're interested in looking at whether you're meeting your recommended daily allowances of all of these foods, is to use an app called Chronometer. It's spelled C-R-O-N-O-M-E-T-E-R dot com. It's free. 
and you simply input, they have a database of basically everything. There hasn't been a food on there that I've tried to search for that I haven't found. They have a database of absolutely every single food. You put in what you're eating and it will tell you how much vitamin A you're getting, how much vitamin B6 you're getting, um, how much fiber you're getting. And then you can see what foods are the highest in those nutrients that you're trying to get more of. And it's actually been really valuable to me because I learned that unless I eat eggs, I don't really get choline. And choline is important for detoxification, liver function, and for creating a neurotransmitter called acetylcholine, which helps us focus and helps our brains work well and our memory. And also helps with constipation too, because choline um, becoming acetylcholine actually helps with the migrating motor complex and our gut motility. I definitely eat more fat than before when I was doing like the, the, the before keto. So I add MCT oil to my morning smoothie following what the, they came up with in that, um, in that diet with the men and the pasta, especially on days when I need to stay full and focus for longer. And I also aim for, um, to do 12 hours of fasting a day. So I'm still doing a kind of intermittent fast, but it's more 12 hours. Um, so I stop eating dinner at like 7 PM, for example, and I eat my breakfast at 7 AM. Um, and in between, I just drink maybe like herbal tea and water. Um, and I try and get in a 16 to 18 hour fast where I can ending dinner at 4 p.m. And I no longer do regular long bouts of intermittent fasting. So like no, no more like day long fast or anything like that. And particularly not when I'm feeling stressed or burnt out. And I'm going to get back to Karina's question about the adrenal fatigue. Um, and that's a good topic for another video because adrenal fatigue is a bit of a misnomer. So would I recommend the ketogenic diet to patients? Um, well, one of the main tenets of naturopathic medicine is do no harm. And so while it may seem like making diet and lifestyle choices is actually benign, like you're not going to botch a surgery or create some crazy side effect from a very toxic medication, but actually making dietary and lifestyle changes do have the potential to do physical and psychological harm, particularly if they're strict recommendations and they make you change your life in drastic ways. So following a strict diet, it may have dramatic health benefits because there's such a discrepancy from what you were doing before to what you're doing now, but it can also isolate us from our friends and our family. Like you can't go to anyone's house when you're following a ketogenic diet. Um, it can also frustrate us. There's nothing to eat when you go out. You're on the highway. There's a Tim Hortons. There's absolutely nothing keto at Tim Hortons, um, except for the coffee without sugar, without milk. Um, and then also these diets restrict our intake of certain nutrients like fiber, vitamins, and minerals. And so this is one of the reasons I don't ever advocate a vegan diet because it, um, the vegan diet is, it doesn't discriminate or doesn't focus on the micro and macronutrients. It just simply discriminates against animal products, which are important sources of lots of vitamins and minerals and, um, and protein and many other things. But if, if, of course, if my patients are already following a vegan diet, then my goal is to help them optimize their nutrient intake as best they can. Because, of course, I sympathize with reasons why someone would want to avoid animal products for ethical reasons. Um, so at least in my personal experience, this cure was stronger than the disease, right? So I did regulate my insulin levels and my glucose levels, but I actually ended up damaging other hormones temporarily. And so I probably didn't need to do it for so long which was evidenced by the hormonal imbalances I began to experience. And particularly for patients who are suffering from metabolic syndrome, type one diabetes and insulin resistance or PCOS, which is another hormonal condition uh, based on insulin resistance, there are many um, powerful benefits to entering ketosis in order to dramatically reverse metabolic dysfunction. But um, in this case, maybe a modified regime combining intermittent fasting and cyclical ketogenic diets can be beneficial. So getting patients to who have metabolic syndrome or insulin resistance to kind of get through a keto flu, get some more metabolic flexibility going, and then put them back on a more modified paleo diet or, um, or have them do cyclo, cyclical keto or have them do some intermittent fasting, like a 12-12 like I do right now, which is pretty easy. Just don't snack after dinner. Um, but this all depends on where patients are at in their journey. So sometimes I meet patients who require and respond well to more heroic lifestyle interventions, so like going on some crazy cleanse and diet and they just are ready to go and they want to do it. Like I've had patients um, at Evergreen at my um, community medicine practice that do like water fasting. So I support them through that, but it's not something I would recommend. Um, but then other times I meet patients relying on several sugary treats a day to get them through. And so in these cases, just tweaking their diet in small ways using baby steps may have powerful disease risk reversing effects. Like uh, there's one patient who I just got him to start eating one 
piece of fruit a day <laughs> that had big changes in his in his health because where he was at was very different from that um, and so that's my article and so I want to address Karina's question so Karina said um, you know, what about if you have adrenal fatigue? Is the ketogenic diet, or I'm gonna also extend that to intermittent fasting, is that a good idea? So with adrenal fatigue, so adrenal fatigue is a bit of a misnomer, but essentially it's low cortisol levels. And low cortisol levels are, um, you know, they can be caused by various things. And one of those things is glucocorticoid resistance in the brain, so it's actually elevated levels of cortisol in your body that are not able to turn off your stress response. This is complicated, but it's essentially elevated cortisol levels that don't turn the switch off. The cortical, the, the, um, the stress response can contribute to symptoms of low cortisol. So you actually have high cortisol levels rather than a dysfunctional adrenal gland. Your adrenal glands are working fine, but your brain is not responding to cortisol. So you're getting these symptoms of elevated inflammation, depression, fatigue, low stress tolerance. Um, so one thing that cortisol does, though, is it elevates our blood sugar. So if we are experiencing hypoglycemia, if our blood sugar falls because of, uh, we're on this blood sugar roller coaster, our body, if it can't eat to bring blood sugar up, will release cort cortisol. A glucocorticoid which can elevate blood sugar and bring it back into the normal range and so it depends where you're at if you're responding to cortisol then you're gonna feel okay you're gonna do a little bit better fasting uh, because there's going to be some cortisol that your body needs to call on to keep your blood sugar steady when you're not consuming any carbohydrates or when you're not consuming um, especially those refined carbohydrates um, so you know, that may be okay, but if you have some cortisol resistance and you're not responding to that cortisol, what will happen is your, your uh, adrenal glands will start to pump out epinephrine and norepinephrine, which are those more like anxiety feeling, like stress response. So it totally depends on where you're at. It's kind of a complicated question because our stress response is so complicated, but essentially like I think in my experience, what was probably going on was that I was dealing with some stress and any, anytime you're doing a more drastic diet, you're adding more stress. Sometimes these stresses can be beneficial. It's like when we think of really intense exercise. Really intense exercise is very health promoting because of the small stresses that it imposes on our body and it imposes our, it causes our body to need to adapt. But if you were gonna go run a marathon every single day, that like that amount of stress sort of tips the balance and it starts to become more chronic stress. So I think in my case, what basically I benefited from a short term stress of doing this keto diet initially. Um, but then when I stayed on it for longer, the chronic stress on my body started to result in some of these deficiencies and hormones and this, this dysregulation of, of cortisol. Um, yeah, so that's a short answer, Karina, but I would probably say if you're feeling exhausted and you're feeling kind of wiped, more um, casual blood sugar regulation would be a better call. And that would probably be definitely not fasting, but eating um, a protein and fat rich breakfast, maybe even a keto breakfast to see how you do on that. Um, but you know, talking to your naturopathic doctor, your functional medicine doctor to see if that fits for you or what the other nuances in your case may be. And that's it everybody. So post any more questions below if you have them. You can also watch this video if you missed part of it. You can watch it. I'm gonna have it up on Facebook and I'm gonna put it on YouTube. Um, my name is Talia Mercajani and that was my year of living ketogenically. Take care.